Thank you, Kim. Um, so like she said, today's talk is about LGBTQ key concepts for care. Um, I do want to start out um, acknowledging my privilege as a white, heterosexual, cisgender woman. Um, I, so I'm not coming at this from lived experience um, because I do not identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. Um, and also, I need to acknowledge that um, I'm not a clinician, so I will not be sharing any experience of providing care to LGBTQ patients. That said, I am coming at this talk today being a researcher who has um, 10 years of experience working with the LGBTQ community, um, identifying their key health issues and working with them to better understand access to care issues and how to better address um, the issues they experience. And also as a certified health education specialist um, with eight years of teaching human sexuality as a course. Um, uh, by the end of this presentation, um, hopefully you'll be able to describe at least two health disparities that are experienced by LGBTQ individuals, um, identify at least two issues affecting access to care for LGBTQ patients um, hopefully you'll be able to distinguish between concepts such as sexual orientation and gender identity. And I hope that you'll be able to describe at least two inclusive practices that you could incorporate to deliver more appropriate or affirming care to your LGBTQ patients. Let's provide some context for the issues and, and for the inclusive practices that I'll be recommending. Um, it is known that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender patients have unique health needs and experience numerous health disparities, okay? Um, over in the College of Public Health, we have um, the Arkansas Center for Health Disparities, um, in which we research and develop and implement and test um, interventions to better address um, health disparities, one of which is trying to better address um, HIV. And with that work, we are largely coming into contact with uh, men who have sex with men, um, women who have sex with both men and women. And um, as such, the sexual and gender minority groups um, have unique needs that um, we have to take into consideration when uh, developing the interventions in the same way that they have unique needs that we need to consider when providing care in a hospital setting. Um, they are largely an underserved population um, that has been historically invisible in our healthcare system. And so through a variety of projects, we're trying to uh, rectify that situation. Uh, ultimately, health disparities that are experienced by LGBTQ uh, people stem from uh, stigma and discrimination they have experienced in a variety of contexts and over the course of their lifetimes. That said, uh, let's uh, shed some light on some of the health disparities that um, are of concern. Namely, LGBT youth are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide um, and have a higher risk for a variety of mental health issues. Um, also, LGBT youth are more likely to be homeless. And so we do have an organization here that operates out of uh, Little Rock, but serves LGBTQ youth statewide who are experiencing homelessness. And so if you are interested in better providing care to that unique population, feel free to contact me. My email will be available at the end. I can provide you um, contact information for that organization if you're interested. Also, elderly LGBT individuals face additional barriers to health because of isolation that they have experienced or are experiencing. Um, we know that generationally, um, LGBT folks um, have had a harder time coming out um, than do current uh, LGBT individuals. And so they have uh, an uh, largely experience isolation as a result and have a lack of social services that are tailored to their uh, unique needs. Also, um, LGBT uh, 
older adults uh, tend to um, have limited contact with culturally competent providers. Um, many times they're not going to be out um, about their identity. And so um, when seeking geriatric care, they may not be um, given uh, access to culturally competent cares, uh, care providers. Also, LGBT populations have the highest rates of tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use for numerous reasons, but um, often cited is um, for uh, mechanisms to try to cope. Um, lesbian women are less likely to get preventive services for cancer, um, and being on a campus uh, where cancer research is of utmost importance, uh, this is something to uh, be considered. Also, gay men are at higher risk for HIV and other um, STDs or STIs, especially among communities of color. And uh, lesbian and bisexual women in particular are more likely to be overweight or obese. So these are all um, health conditions that uh, must be um, acknowledged in order to be addressed appropriately. When we look at transgender patients in particular, a Approximately, uh, they experience approximately four times the national rate of HIV infection. Um, also, over a quarter have misused drugs or alcohol specifically to cope. And we know that at least 40% or better have attempted suicide. And this is in comparison to only 1.6% of the general population. So you can see a tremendously uh, disproportionate amount um, have attempted suicide. Um, for what it's worth, someone uh, seems to be making a lot of noise uh, next to your microphone. Um, so for those of us who are in the room, um, we'd appreciate just making sure all mics are muted. Thank you. Uh, also, we know that trans patients are less likely to have health insurance than heterosexual or lesbian, gay, or bisexual individuals. And this obviously creates um, an access to care uh, issue. Now, when seeking health care, um, Many trans folks have been refused care due to having a transgender identity. Um, they experience discrimination and stigma right when they walk in the door. Um, also, we know that 28% were harassed and 2% have reported being victims of, of violence inside a medical setting. And so um, a lot of times it's important to recognize that while that might not have occurred at your uh, facility. It may have happened to the individuals at another healthcare facility. And so when they're entering the door, they're coming with this traumatic experience. Um, and so that can shape and sometimes um, influence their demeanor and uh, their ability to access care. We know that about half have reported having to educate their medical providers about how to provide appropriate care um, to themselves and um, their peers. We know that over three quarters have postponed necessary care due to fear of experiencing stigma or discrimination in a healthcare setting. We look at transgender Arkansans. Some uh, data that I think is noteworthy. Regarding seeking health care, almost a third have reported experiencing a problem in the past year with their insurance. Um, and this is all data reported in 2016. So we know that a little over a third had at least one negative experience related to being transgender. Um, and this could have included being refused treatment, being verbally harassed, or being physically or even sexually assaulted or having to teach the provider about transgender people in order to get appropriate care that they were seeking that day. We know that in the past year, almost a third of respondents did not see a doctor when they needed to because of fear of being mistreated as a transgender person. And at least 40% did not see a doctor when needed because they could not afford it. And we also know that about 11% of respondents um, reported that a professional, such as a psychologist or counselor, tried to stop them from being transgender or identifying with a transgender identity. Now, as healthcare providers, it's important that we recognize where patients are coming from, and we need to be aware of some common issues or concerns that exist among members of the LGBTQ community. Um, these are issues that have been commonly reported, um, and so I'm presenting to you uh, these, uh, these general concerns in that way. So, Previous negative or inadequate experiences with the healthcare providers they may have encountered will make LGBTQ patients more skeptical of or returning to the healthcare system. And so I think it's important to just acknowledge that up front. Um, 
So we need to not just provide care um, to our LGBTQ patients that we encounter, but openly provide and affirm uh, care to, uh, to LGBTQ people at large. Um, there's an assumption that everyone in the practice or department that is straight, and this can create, um, perhaps unbeknownst to you, an unwelcome or unsafe feeling towards the environment on behalf of LGBTQ patients. And so anytime you can display um, affirming symbols, whether it's, you know, uh, any rainbow stickers, you know, equality stickers, things of that nature, any literature or brochures that you might display, posters on the wall that might have same-sex partners, um, you know, those are cues for LGBTQ patients that this is going to be a welcoming and safe environment. Also, um, not being asked about sexual orientation or gender identity may come across as unwelcoming um, because if you don't ask, then there could be an assumption um, that you don't want to know or that uh, revealing that type of information is unwanted. So I want to note here at this point in the presentation that routine and standardized collection of sexual orientation and gender identity information in our electronic health record system can achieve a number of things. Starting out, it can help us assess access and satisfaction with quality of care among LGBTQ patients. Then it can inform the delivery of more appropriate health services to the LGBTQ patients, and ultimately it will help us begin to address many of the health disparities um, mentioned previously in this talk. Um, and I want to note that with the EPIC upgrades, um, our SOGI data collection is now part of our UAMS system. Um, but it's notwithstanding to mention that SOGI information is still protected information. A few more um, healthcare access issues I think that are worth mentioning. So even when providers do not demonstrate outwardly negative attitudes or biases, they may still be lacking the education needed to work well with LGBTQ patients. But hopefully for those of you who are participating or watching this talk, um, you are you know, tackling that issue um, just by the nature of seeking more information for yourselves. I'll also at the end of the talk mention additional resources for you um, if you're looking to better educate yourself. Um, there's also a lack of research on LGBTQ issues and a lack of interventions tailored to these populations, and this definitely remains a significant barrier to care. Um, you know, in order for any of our uh, medical interventions to work well, um, we need there needs to be adoption of the intervention and implementation, and so we have to make sure that they are tailored um, in order to secure adoption of those interventions. Um, also, institutionalized heterosexism, transphobia, and biphobia exist, and they remain barriers to care for many patients. I think it's also worth mentioning that diminishment or exclusion of racial minorities within the sexual and gender minority population at large. Um, in other words, I'm mentioning intersectional identities. Um, so any diminishment or exclusion of our intersectional identities is problematic. So we want to make sure that we affirm um, all identities and a spectrum of identities within our practices. So what can we do? Well, you don't have to answer any of these questions today. Um, you certainly don't have to um, answer to me, but I invite you to reflect um, a little bit. And so thinking about, you know, what are our words and actions um, really suggesting in the environment we're creating? Um, what are our implicit biases that might be informing our words and deeds? And also, just think about, have you ever experienced any microaggressions? You know, and if you have, then I would invite you to sort of um, open the window, then a possibility to develop some empathy for LGBTQ patients who might be experiencing, either, if not the same um, bias, but could be even worse than what you've experienced. In order to better uh, provide care to LGBTQ patients, I think it's important that we first wrap our heads around some key terms and concepts. So um, as we're addressing terms that are gonna follow in the next few slides that are all gonna be related to sexual orientation and gender identity, I think we first need to break down the components of our identities, okay? We all come to the table with uh, these, these facets to ourselves. Um, we all have our, our bodies, 
um, that inform our biological sex or sex assigned at birth um, based on key anatomy um, and chromosomes. Um, we all have our minds that shape and influence how we see ourselves in terms of our gender identities, um, our appearance and how we project um, our, our gender um, and our portrayal of that gender expression. Um, and we uh, have uh, in our hearts attractions to others, and that may inform our sexual orientation. Even um, the lack of attraction or um, no desire, therefore being asexual, is still a sexual orientation. So, um, uh, as mentioned early on in one of the key objectives, I hope you'll be able to distinguish between these key concepts of sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, it's hard to move forward um, until you can really wrap your head around uh, the separate and distinctness of these, these concepts. So, these things are not the same. They are separate and distinct from one another. We all have them. Okay, all people have a sexual orientation and a gender identity. I want you to also think about the fact that how people identify can change. Um, as we evolve in our understanding of ourselves as individuals, as we gain more experiences in our interaction with others, um, this influences um, our identities. Okay, also terminology will vary. It will vary for you um, and how you come to know terms and adopt and understand terms, but also um, socioculturally, as we learn more through um, research and experience, um, creation of, of new terms will occur. So that said, um, as each of us as individuals come to know more terms, we may find more uh, or different labels that we adopt for ourselves that become more applicable for us um, as we understand them over time. So at the end of the day, these things are different and I'll break them down um, in the next couple of slides. All right, so we're first gonna consider sexual orientation. This is defined as how a person identifies their physical and emotional attraction to others, okay? Uh, this is based on any one or all of the following com components, desire, behavior, and identity, okay? If we're defining se sexual orientation based upon desire, this would, um, could be um, how we could get the label uh, based on same-sex attraction or opposite sex attraction or different sex attraction. Those are labels that would help describe desire-based sexual orientation. Alternatively, and this is particularly um, applicable for those who do public health research, we often ascribe sexual orientation um, based on behaviors reported by um, respondents on surveys um, or our patients, et cetera. So um, we often ask for example, men, do you have sex with other men? If so, that's a behavior-based sexual orientation we're ascribing to that group. This would be also true for men who have sex with both men and women, and same is true for women who have um, same or different sex partners. That said, um, we have our own identity based upon um, our sexual orientation. So which of these labels might best fit you? Straight, um, which is typically uh, adopted by people who have different sex attraction, or um, yes, and are heterosexual. Uh, for those who have same sex attractions um, and behaviors, you might better identify as gay or lesbian. Some people better identify or feel like bisexual um, is the best identity to describe them. Um, alternatively, queer is a label that many people better describes them because they don't identify with any of the other terms. So again, reiterating the point that sexual orientation can be based on any one or all of these components, desire, behavior, and identity. Now, um, we're going to look at gender. And I'll, starting out, um, I need you to kind of open your mind to the fact that gender is uh, more than just a binary, okay? Um, I know that this, just saying that alone um, is going to uh, ruffle some people's feathers, but uh, this is not your fault. <laughs> 
Many of us have been raised in a society where gender is a binary and only a binary. That said, um, I submit that when we know better, we can do better, right? And so now that we know better, based on um, a historical context of research, um, which includes um, observation and understanding of multiple cultures around the world, um, we know that gender is more than a binary. Um, we also know that maybe people who identify with genders beyond the binary have been closeted for a long time, um, fear of rejection by society, um, and, and potential fear of criminality um, based upon identifying as such. So I submit what gender actually is is much more complex, um, and I invite you to look at it uh, on a spectrum. So what makes up our gender? Gender identity and gender expression. Uh, many students or folks with whom I've had conversations um, about sexual orientation and gender identity often seem to find it easier to wrap their heads around sexual orientation and what that means and how you can describe and define that. But many people struggle with recognizing that there are different facets and components of our gender. But one way to start out by understanding this is to think that, um, you know, mentally we have an internal sense or understanding of our gender and the gender with which we identify. And then we project that or display that with those that we come in contact through our clothing, our mannerisms, um, our hair, um, our way of speaking and addressing each other. So, um, full disclosure, I was assigned female at birth and I identify as a woman. Um, I project that identity through my clothing and dress and hair options by looking very feminine. I prefer to wear dresses um, and heels and wear makeup and have long hair. Those are all things that are traditionally been um, markers for feminine, femininity and femaleness. And, um, and I adopt and project those things. But not everyone does, and particularly those who do not ascribe as uh, feminine women, um, you know, you are going to project yourself and your gender identity very differently. Um, but this is just one way of demonstrating and helping you understand um, what those terms mean and how they're applied. Now, looking at the T in LGBTQ. So transgender or trans is an umbrella term for persons whose gender identity is different from the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, say it again, but a little differently. This is a gender identity that is not congruent with assigned sex at birth, okay? So some terms that we often hear are transgender woman or trans woman, transgender man or trans man, and trans feminine or trans masculine. Um, to further clarify, trans woman is a woman who was assigned male at birth. Alternatively, a trans man is a man who was assigned female at birth. Okay, so I want you to think about how those terms are being applied. Um, so trans woman is a term for a woman who identifies as a woman who is assigned male at birth. So we use trans as the adjective to describe the woman. Okay, and we did the same for the man. Now, another, word, another way of looking at this, um, because many of you may have heard the term cisgender and are curious to know what that means or what label uh, that would be applied um, to what group of people. Well, it's a term to refer to anyone whose gender identity is the same as the sex they were assigned at birth, including myself. So, in other words, not transgender, you are cisgender, okay? Now, because people who identify as non-binary or genderqueer also have gender identities that are not congruent with the assigned sex at birth, these folks are often included with trans identities, okay? So gender non-binary is an umbrella term for genders that are not exclusively male or female. Also, non-binary is an identity that seems to trip up some people, particularly here in the South, where everything is gendered. I mean, you think about how many times someone said ma'am or sir to you in the last 24 hours, right? So many individuals who identify as non-binary do not use gendered pronouns, and instead they may use they or another pronoun. And for any grammar snobs out there, know that they is now an accepted singular use of a pronoun. So it's okay. <laughs> Um, I also want to point out uh, here 
in the context of non-binary because you can, if you're able to see uh, the screen, there are other terms included in this umbrella such as androgynous, gender fluid, agender, gender non-conforming, and gender queer. So this is where I want to point out the term queer. Um, queer in terms of the acronym LGBTQ is probably the singularly most asked about letter that I get um, whenever I'm, I'm giving a talk or a lecture. So queer is an umbrella term for sexual and gender minorities who are not heterosexual or are not cisgender, okay? So historically, this has been used pejoratively, but beginning in the late 80s, um, a group of queer activists have decided to reclaim um, that term and began deliberately using it um, to be provocative, but also um, to be politically radical. And um, it's an identifier for anyone who doesn't feel a connection to the other labels um, LGBT, okay? It gives space for there to be alternative identities and um, gives space for to exist on the spectrum outside of any of the other labels. Okay. So reviewing some key concepts, particularly these four points. All right. So sexual orientation. So this will describe whom you are physically and emotionally attracted to, whom you have sex with, or how you identify your sexuality. Okay. And that's separate and distinct from gender identity, which is what your internal sense tells you your gender is. This may or may not match with your assigned sex at birth, okay? And sex would here refer to the presence of anatomy or chromosomes. And then your gender expression is how you portray your gender identity. It's how you present yourself to society through your clothing, mannerisms, and other ways. Again, if you have any questions about any of these things up to now, um, I encourage you to jot them down and I'll um, display my email at the end. You can shoot me an email um, or I think someone will be um, fielding questions for a few minutes towards the end. So an, an additional term to note here is gender dysphoria. This will occur when there's a conflict between the sex a person was assigned at birth and how they actually identify. Okay, this may be experienced as distress over the mismatch between one's gender identity and their assigned sex, but is not the same as gender nonconformity. Okay, whereas gender nonconformity would represent an identity um, that someone feels is most appropriate, a label for them. Okay. Now that we've addressed many appropriate terms and definitions, I want to point some things out to you that I hope you will avoid. Um, so across the top, uh, there are some terms that have been used over time, sometimes interchangeably. Generally, just avoid those altogether today. Um, generally, these uh, post-operative or intersex are more accurate terms than the ones shown. Um, the ones shown are historically denigrating and focused more on cross-dressing. So unless you know specifically that someone with whom you're interacting identifies with one of these labels, um, instead, transgender is a broader, more inclusive term to use, okay? Also, please be aware of how you're using the term transgender. Transgender is an adjective. It is not a noun or a verb. So we don't want to say transgendered because that would imply that something happened to someone or was done to someone, and that's um, inaccurate. And also, um, it's not a noun, so you wouldn't say the transgenders um, in my clinic, because that's just simply incorrect as well, um, grammatically speaking. Transgender is an adjective used to describe an individual. Okay. Um, transitioning is a process. It's a process of changing one's social identity, gender expression, or physical characteristics to feel more comfortable with who they are. Um, it's a process um, that many transgender people will go through, but there's no, it is going to look different for everyone. Um, there's no one set of steps. There's no milestones to be achieved necessarily in this process. Um, uh, there's no one defined beginning or end. You don't, most people are uncomfortable with the idea of completing transition, you know, um, or 
That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, and this may depend on many personal factors. So someone's ability to uh, transition, uh, to, dis to express their gender um, in the way that they want to and are most comfortable um, is going to depend upon their socioeconomic status, um, access to health care, and a number of other things. Um, Transition health care, though, is medically necessary, and so it's important to provide for all transgender patients, okay? For many folks, it can mean the difference between life and death. And also, um, transition status is not the same as identity. Um, we can maybe dialogue more about that, but just know that. Okay. And also a part of the transitioning process, um, one key facet is social transition. And so name change is a major part of that um, process, which is why um, getting preferred name and pronoun is so important for our patients to affirm their identities. Okay. Um, using name and pronouns trans people ask us to use is extremely important. Um, it it really can uh, mean the difference between life and death for some people. So, I, and this is where I want to mention again, a gender non-binary individual may use pronouns like they, them, theirs, or even other pronouns that may be even more unfamiliar to you, such as Z, zeers, zeers, or even others. So if you're wondering why using a chosen name or preferred name and pronoun of a person uh, is so important, um, there is research to back this up. So a particular study I wanted to note, um, they examined the relationship between chosen name use as a proxy for youth's gender affirmation in various contexts um, in combination with mental health uh, um, outcomes among transgender youth. So the further methods data came from a community cohort sample of 129 transgender and gender nonconforming youth from three U.S. cities. And some of the results show um, when adjusting for personal characteristics and social support, chosen name use in more contexts was associated with a decrease in depression, suicidal ideation, and attempts. In conclusion, for transgender youth um, who choose a name different from the one given at birth, use of their chosen name in multiple contexts affirms their gender identity and reduces mental health risks known to be high in that group. So switching gears, let's focus on what we can do to create an inclusive environment and for our patients and in our healthcare settings. Um, so things to do are not to say these things. Um, don't say things like, I would never be able to tell, or you're doing a good job. Um, you may mean that as a compliment, but it, it comes across in a way um, that will put your patients um, uh, in a way in a feeling of discomfort and distress. So because you're implying the fact that they're passing for uh, either a masculine or a feminine person on the binary system and remembering we're trying to break down the binary and affirm identities across the spectrum. So, and here's some other terms I've listed that are just inappropriate to use. Um, Again, thinking grammatically, transgender is an adjective. And then also, we just want to avoid some of these outdated terms that could be de uh, denigrating. I love this image because um, um, the person depicted here says, um, I don't say woman trapped in a man's body because I am a woman. This is a woman's body. So we have to um, open our minds to um, what bodies look like um, and how they may differ from um, pictures or portrayal, portrayals that we've, as we've seen them historically. So also what not to do. So don't ask unless absolutely clinically relevant about genitals, about family, about dating or sex life, or about transition. And I say that to say I understand that many uh, physicians or nurses will need to um, take a sexual history um, or an organ inventory. I get that and that's fine if that's clinically relevant to the procedure or service you're providing that day. So there are ways to ask about those things that are um, affirming and are unbiased and appropriate. So you wouldn't say things um, about body parts like, are they real 
or have you had the surgery or do you still have a whatever? Um, because that just implies that you are curious and your patient is definitely going to be on guard and wondering what's the relevance of this question. Um, but, you know, you don't need to know about my penis if I'm here for a hurt wrist, right? So, um, so we should be thinking about what's clinically relevant to the procedure or service and, um, and how can you ask a question to be as respectful as possible. You also want to avoid asking questions about family um, unless absolutely necessary because, um, you know, many LGBTQ people, particularly here in the South, have um, complex uh, relationships with family members if their family has not been supportive or affirming. Um, you don't need to ask about someone's sex life unless um, you're there to treat perhaps a sexual, uh, sexually transmitted infection or something of that nature. Uh, but if you do ask, don't ask. Uh, it, there are ways to ask questions that are uh, applied, appropriate, and affirming, that are non-gendered, and don't make assumptions about someone's sexual orientation. Um, and then, again, just reiterating the point about transition, there are ways to ask if it's necessary, particularly like if you're going to continue someone's hormone replacement therapy regimen, you know, and you're transferring that service from another provider or something. But... Um, but you wouldn't ask in a way that implies that there are milestones to be achieved. In general, if you take away nothing else from today's talk, you cannot assume someone's gender or sexual orientation based upon how they look or sound. Okay, So to demonstrate uh, that you're avoiding these assumptions, um, simply say things like, how may I help you? Or the patient is here to see you. Or, um, you know, are you in a relationship there are ways you can ask questions that are non-gendered and don't apply assumptions about sexual orientation or gender identity. So other examples of inclusive practices, and these are compiled from um, a slew of research studies, including ones that have been conducted here in the state. So it's suggested to leave a blank space after questions on gender, offering a transgender option even on intake forms, okay? And I understand that being in a healthcare system, it may be difficult for you to individually have your own intake forms that said, if given the option or in some of your other documentation that informs your practice, um, do you consider making those adjustments and changes? Also, just using gender neutral language um, in any of your encounters with the patients, but particularly in taking a sexual relationship history. Um, asking for chosen or preferred name, not just legal name. And I know that we do that now in the EPIC upgrade, we're um, asking for prefer preferred name and even pronoun. So making sure those fields are available to all healthcare um, staff. And introducing yourself with your name and pronouns and are asking what pronouns another person uses. So when I started the talk, I said, hi, I'm Dr. Marshall, she, her, and hers. Um, and so that's something you could consider doing um, when you first encounter your patients. You know, I'm Dr. So-and-so um, or nurse so-and-so, and I use, you know, whatever pronouns and how do you identify yourself. Um, this may, one of the questions I often get in response to that is, what if people are offended that I don't automatically identify them as masculine or feminine? Um, short response is, um, it's easier to just make it a standard of care practice um, and make your patients aware that this is how I introduce myself to all of my patients, and I'm going to ask all of my patients these questions about their preferred name and pronoun, so it's not just you that I'm singling out. Um, and I think, too, you'll find that fewer people are offended um, than you might anticipate, and more people will uh, positively respond than you anticipate. Also, um, I get this is a challenge to do in an existing building, uh, but provide gender neutral bathrooms where possible. If you are um, willing and able to change even the signage on your existing bathroom facilities, I um, encourage you to do that. Some other inclusive practices I hope that you will consider. Avoiding assumptions about another person's gender or sexual orientation in general. Um, 
And if you mess up, simply apologize, correct yourself, and move on. Um, I say that to say there's no need to belabor a point um, or explain, you know, yourself and why you said or did what you did. Just apologize, correct yourself, and demonstrate through word and deed that you'll make every effort not to, um, to do the same misstep again. Correct your peers if they say or do something offensive. And this is of utmost importance because, um, you know, we want to be contributing to a healthy, holistic environment for all of our patients. Um, and so if you see any of your peers doing or saying something offensive, um, let's not be uh, bystanders in that and instead be proactive about creating a positive environment. Also, it's important to respect privacy and confidentiality of all our patients and clients. I'm just saying that again. Um, so avoid talking about particularly SOGI information or um, these unique cases that you encounter um, that involve LGBTQ patients um, in the hallway, in the elevator, etc. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, I think being uh, part of UAMS, we are all about patient-centered care. And so in order to implement patient-centered care principles, you know, just keep it in mind that these inclusive practices are a part of that. And they help lead us to um, performing care in a way that shows respect for our patients' preferences. And so all the inclusive care practices just mentioned um, are um, patient preference. And, um, and so we want to be mindful of that to provide the best care possible. I do have a few case studies. Um, I can run through a couple of these. Um, and these are not long. So at the very least, um, since this is not a, a scenario in which we can do a lot of open interactive Q&A, but I want to mention these scenarios and then um, I'll sort of just help you help you answer the questions. Um, so, for example, if you have two women who arrive for an appointment, uh, particularly with a baby, for, say, a six-month checkup and immunization, um, someone, uh, perhaps a front desk staff member, introduces herself to a patient named Janice and says, oh, did you bring your sister? How nice. Tanya and Janice both frown. Tanya says with exasperation, actually, I'm her wife, and this is our baby. Um, so, thinking through that scenario, what could the front desk staff person have said instead? You know, we talked about it, perhaps just, hello, welcome to the clinic. You know, nice to see you today and leave it at that. Something very simple, non-gendered. Uh, there are no assumptions about orientation given, et cetera. Um, or you could go further and say, who do you have with you here today? So you're more asking an open question instead of making an assumption about who that person is in relationship to the patient. Um, how could the person apologize? Um, just simply saying, I'm sorry, for, didn't mean to make that assumption, and move on, you know. Um, here's a scenario in which someone named Kyle is working a registration desk and a new patient arrives. The patient is wearing a dress and heels and has long hair. And despite the patient's appearance, the identification documents, such as insurance card and driver's license, say George Brogan, you know, which is obviously um, a very masculine sounding name. So how should Kyle greet the patient at the front desk? How about just a very simple, open, welcoming, but non-gendered way? Like, nice to see you today. Um, how can we help? You know, and how can Kyle find out what the name and pronoun of the patient prefers to use? Well, by modeling. You know, hi, I'm Kyle. I use they, them pronouns. What are your name and pronouns? And, or perhaps that is um, on intake forms. Um, so it doesn't have to be verbally addressed. When the clinician is ready to see the patient, how should Kyle call the patient into the exam room? By preferred name. Okay. Or um, if sometimes this may be the there may be the only patient in the waiting room, you know, um, there are ways to handle that more uh, intimately and one-on-one. -on -one. Um, how should Kyle let the clinician know about the patient's preferred name and pronoun? Depends upon their system. You know, if they have um, an electronic system where the clinician can see the intake, um, you know, information, hopefully that screen or those fields will be shared. Um, alternatively, um, make an asterisk um, about patient's preferred name and pronoun, perhaps in an, an, a chart or note section, and share that with the clinician. Um, I'm not sure about logistics of all 
um, patient services, but um, there are certainly ways in which that information can be shared um, quietly and appropriately and respectfully. So looking at Chris, um, basically um, Chris is completing a registration paperwork and skips the question on gender. Chris says, I don't identify with the options male or female and left it blank on purpose. So how would uh, Mike, who's at the front desk, proceed with this registration? Well, there are a couple of things that need to happen. Either one, the forms need to be changed to be more inclusive of all patients. But until that happens, again, making an asterisk or a note to um, better uh, have a descriptor, such as transgender, for example, on, on the patient's chart. And, um, and just making sure that appropriate um, gender identity and pronouns are used throughout the rest of the visit. And thinking about Herb, so Herb's situation is which um, he discloses a friend as a preferred contact for, uh, um, on his paperwork. And Stella, um, who's working with him, um, is surprised that Herb would choose a friend and ask why he, could he not include a family member instead? Well, why do you think this would upset Herb? Um, clearly because he's got a complicated relationship with his family. Perhaps he's been um, rejected or ostracized by his family. And so we would want to make sure that um, we're respectful of Herb's wishes and um, acknowledge and accept the listing of any friend or close, um, close confidant as a preferred contact. Um, and also, um, let's not probe in, uh, when non-clinically relevant into uh, a particular situation. If all we need is a name and phone number for a preferred contact, let's leave it alone. Okay, and here are some references for you. Um, so I didn't make all this up. Also, you want to know that uh, there are uh, nationwide, there's a project called Project Affirm. And so if you go to the Fenway Institute, you can find more information about that and see um, a little more about affirming care practices that are recommended, such as the ones um, discussed today. And for any additional training that you uh, may want to pursue um, to better deliver care to your LGBT patients, um, I encourage you to visit um, the LGBT Health Education Center. Um, for a variety of webinars um, and other topics. Okay, uh, with remaining time, I'll open it up to any questions that may be um, from our participants. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. What a great presentation and um, eye-opening information to incorporate into current practice. If you guys have any questions, um, You can unmute at this point and um, ask your question. Um, if you have trouble doing that, of course, you can see Dr. Marshall's email address, or if you're not comfortable doing that, perfectly understandable. Her email address is right there, and she's, I know for a fact, she gets back with you quickly, mm -hmm. um, and she's very thorough. If you are joining us via Cisco meeting and um, web streaming with us, there is a chat feature as well, and we can you can type a question, and we can have that read aloud. So we'll be happy to do that, um, you know, entertain any questions, and um while you guys are out there, while we have Dr. Marshall here with us. Okay, you have uh, one question. Do you know any population numbers for various groups, um, i.e., what percentage of the larger population identify as transgendered? Okay, so the question I heard was, um, do I have any population numbers, particularly asking about transgender individuals? Um, so the short answer is there's not a lot of good um, research on that because um, not just healthcare systems, but research studies in general have historically not done a great job at um, capturing transgender identities um, in their participant populations. But a number that I have heard and seen reported um, nationally is about 1% of the population I currently identifies as transgender. Um, but again, that's maybe not the most accurate a number, but it is a number for you to start with. Um, and then 
in terms of um, sexual and gender minority individuals in general, some research reports um, at least 8%, and I've seen upwards of 10% of people um, identify as lesbian or gay and bisexual. Um, but again, that is not a number to take and run with, and you know, but that is, those are reports that I have seen. Um, so we just need to do a better job about capturing, you know, sexual orientation and gender identity so that we do have a better idea of the, the, the scope of the population that we're working with. A question that I kind of just thought of, and I don't really know how to phrase it as a question, but it seems like it could be an insurance nightmare. Like right. if you're trying to bill, you have a patient that, you know, that comes in, um, their insurance may be under one name possibly, but they identify under something different. Right. So have, have you dealt much with that as far as like clinicians and that is kind of how do you sort that out, I suppose? So I will say that um, Dr. Kate Stewart and myself we're both in the College of Public Health, but we have been, um, and she even more than I, um, have been participating on the Healthcare Equality Index um, Committee, the UAMS, that is charged with tracking and reporting um, LGBT-related data to um, participate in the Healthcare Equality Index survey and scoring for healthcare institutions across the U.S. So that said, we have been tasked with the um, need to educate um, our billing, coding, registration staff on how to better capture sexual orientation and gender identity data with EPIC. So through those trainings, we've heard a lot from coding and billing people about that those issues specifically, um, and it's not easy. There's no simple solution right now because depending upon the insurance provider, I know that some some of it is about coding, and there are healthcare providers, there are providers here at UAMS who know how to best code for patient care, um, regardless of you know legal sex or name and how that may differ on different documents, um, depending upon the care that's provided. There are going to be some insurance companies that will reject claims no matter what if there's a mismatch in data reported. Um, and I think that those are all being handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and from my understanding, if uh, a claim is rejected, um, folks here in billing are going back to the insurance company um, with amended claims, um, with additional documentation um, to better uh, get coverage when they can. Um, but for sure, this is uh, something that's going to be, um, there are going to be many hurdles. They're going to have to be jumped long term, and we're going to have to tackle it top down, you know, with insurance companies being more amenable to um, changing their documentation to accepting, um, you know, um, claims made for procedures for services uh, on behalf of patients from a variety of gender identities.